Well, good morning. Here we are, our last presentation. So glad to be here. Praise God. Did you guys sleep well? Yes. All right, fantastic. I've slept like a rock here. It's been fantastic. I, I think I've gotten at least eight hours, maybe more, every night. It's been a real luxury. I'm, I'm very, very thankful. We'll learn about that as a component to longevity in just a moment. But before we start, I just wanted to pray one more time as a few of us are coming in. Uh, just bow your heads with me as I kneel. Loving Father in heaven, thank you that you desire us to be healthy and to have a good life, not just in heaven, but here. And I just pray, Father, that you would speak through me what you would desire to speak, not only to my brothers and sisters here, but online. And I just ask, Lord, that you would be the one exalted and glorified and that we might enjoy life and that we might enjoy it more abundantly as you designed we should and share that message with as many people as possible. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, everybody wants more life, but not just a longer life. They want more quality of life, wouldn't you say? Because who wants to live to be 100 if you're in a nursing home? Right? Nobody would want that. Right? That's, that's obvious. Now, Ponce de Leon was an explorer that looked for the physical fountain of youth, but of course he never found it. But we're still looking for that fountain of youth. And if we can't find the fountain of youth, we at least try to appear youthful. One of my colleagues is a dermatologist and Every time he does Botox on someone, the nurses want the leftovers. They want a little extra squirt here and there uh, to get rid of those uh, wrinkles. Even though we had a big economic downturn in 2008, uh, depression, surprisingly, plastic surgery kept doing fine. And even though people have to pay out of pocket for that. Isn't that crazy? Unbelievable. And you may say, well, I would never do anything that invasive. A lot of people would say, I'd never go under the knife or something like that. Well, maybe you wouldn't, but why do those gray hairs bother you? Have you thought about that? I mean, you might say, well, you know, I, I'm not superficial and I, I maybe wouldn't do that. Well, but how about the wrinkles? Do the wrinkles bother you? You know, it's interesting. We think of that, oh, that's all a female thing. Women are just so vain, right? And, you know, guys, we're like, oh... I am how I am, right? But that's not true. Have you ever taken a group picture? How many people have taken a group picture? Right? You put the women in front and the guys in the back, and you count down the picture, and it goes like this. Okay, one, two, three. Have you noticed that in the back? Yeah, well, why is that? Why, why do we do that? Why does that bother us? I mean, were we maybe meant to be taller than we are? Maybe those gray hairs aren't part of the original plan. Maybe the wrinkles should bother you. Have you thought about that? I mean, maybe when we look at our lives, we're striving to be younger and stronger because we sense that something is wrong, right? Think about the supplement industry. People are looking for that Tahitian noni or the special uh, mangosteen extract, right, to keep them strong and powerful, but despite our best efforts, all of us seem to follow the same trajectory eventually, right? We all follow the way to aging. We get weaker over time. We get less sharp mentally. And if you think about it too long, it may even be depressing to you. But there is hope. When you look at our bodies, especially the brain, you find that the brain wasn't really seemingly designed for just 79 years, 80 years, because that's kind of the average. Incidentally, when you look at first world countries, um, more developed nations, you generally see a lifespan of about 70 to 80 years. And we say, oh, wow, this is wonderful. You know, this is much better than the Dark Ages, etc. But you know what's interesting? When you go back to David's time and look at Psalm chapter 90, verse 10, what did he say the average lifespan was? 70 to 80, right? So what have we really done? 
That's the question. I, I tell people that modern medicine is very helpful in certain situations. But as far as actual longevity, that is not where it's at. Actual longevity comes from different factors that aren't necessarily related to technology. But when you look at our brains, what's very interesting is did you know that you can live a normal life on half a brain? Dr. Ben Carson, some of you may know him, uh, at the time, perhaps the greatest pediatric neurosurgeon in the world, perfected a procedure called the hemispherectomy for surgeries, where he takes out half of someone's brain. How can they live on half a brain? Unbelievable. But when you look at the actual capacity of this organ, it's tremendous. It's estimated the average person only fills a small percentage of their brain by the time they die. Do you realize that? And they could put massive more amounts of information in that. Even the Einsteins, the Schweitzers of our race, only fill less than 10%. Isn't that crazy? The brain has a massive capacity. It would be like sending your kindergartner with a little iPad to, to their uh, preschool with a terabyte of memory. They're never going to fill that, right, in the amount of time. And that's the concept when you look at the brain. There's no way anyone can ever fill that in the amount of time we have. And what's very interesting is that the brain has secrets that really aren't unlocked for most of us. Have you ever heard of people that are idiot savants? Have you ever heard of that? They're able to tell you, for example, my stepbrother can tell you if you say, well, I was born on this day, this year. He's like, oh, you were born on a Wednesday. And he can tell you that instantly. He can calculate that within a second. How is that possible? Well, he has one area of his brain that is highly developed while other areas are undeveloped. But there are some people that are just savants. Did you know that? They're not idiots. They can learn five, six, seven, eight languages with no problem. In fact, they can taste colors. They can feel numbers. They have what's called synesthesias, which are crossing of the senses. Have you heard of that? Maybe not. But those potentials are there in our brain for all of us. All of us just can't tap into that. So when you look at our brains, it literally has a capacity, not just for hundreds of years, but perhaps a thousand or more years. Maybe... It has a capacity forever. Well, the following five blue zones do not live forever. Perhaps you've seen this article. It's a classic article from National Geographic. The five blue zones are the ones that we're going to talk about, Okinawa, Sardinia, and Loma Linda. But the other two that I'm not going to talk about are Ikaria and uh, Nicoya. Ikaria, Greece, and Nicoya, Costa Rica. Those are the blue zones, which are places where people don't live forever, but they live a lot longer than you and I. And that's the concept, is what are they doing? And how can I do the same thing and reap those benefits? We'll start in Japan, the land of the rising sun. And in Okinawa, we find that individuals not only live to a greater quantity of life, but they have a much greater quality. When you look at the stats, uh, it doesn't seem to be very extensive, but even two or three years is very statistically significant from a scientific standpoint. They have a lot less of the number one killer, which is heart disease, and a lot less breast and prostate cancer, which although many people who don't smoke, they don't get lung cancer, breast and prostate are still very, very common ways to die. They have a plant-based diet, but they have something very unique called ikigai. What is ikigai? Well, it means the reason you get up in the morning, your purpose, your motto, your theme of life. And that's the question is, what is your ikigai? What is your meaning of life? What is your purpose of life? Now, for Fumiyasu, his ikigai is the senior Olympics. His favorite event, the pole vault. Any pole vaulters here? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow, praise the Lord. That's amazing. Well, but he still keeps pole vaulting. That's the thing. And um, that's his reason for living. 
That's his reason for continuing to train and keep himself fit. What about yours? The Okinawans tend to grow their own food, uh, but the interesting thing is they eat a large quantity of food, but they don't really gain a lot of weight. And the reason why is their foods are high in nutrients, but very low in caloric density. When you look at the way that they're doing this, it seems almost effortless. At Serie Taguchi, at 104 years old, is enjoying many components of longevity. He's taking a break there, getting some rest in his garden where he's growing his own food, uh, exercise in, in weeding the garden. And um, what's interesting, though, is uh, they asked him one question as he was absorbing his vitamin D. The interviewer said, well, Mr. Taguchi, can you tell me why the red gloves? He said, they're easy to find. The Okinawans also have a social network called a moai, and it's a group of people that go through life together and help each other. And that moai is basically a non-relative group. So non-family members, but people that you are together with on a regular basis, at least three times a week, essentially. Anyone have a moai? People you get together with three times a week, non-relatives? Uh, maybe a couple people. That's good. Unfortunately, Okinawa is losing its longevity edge. And of course, that is due to the fall of all modern civilization, the Golden Arches. They uh, have let go of a lot of their traditions in their culture and have adopted a lot of Western ways. Let's go to Italy. To an island off the coast is Sardinia and in a village called Silanus, you will meet Tonino. Tonino at 74 years old, I think there's a few people around 74 years old, right, close? You'll meet him and he works from dawn to dusk, splitting wood, repairing fences, slaughtering sheep, and he only needs the help of a little cane now. That's about it. You'll also meet a patriarch who's 103 years old, as he presides over the meal of his family. In the Sardinian way, they have one meal with every person they're related to once a week. Any of you do that? Anyone see everyone they're related to once a year, maybe? <laughs> maybe once a year, no? But this is every week. What's very interesting is typically who lives longer, men or women? Yes, but in Sardinia, that's not true. In Sardinia, men live just as long as women. And normally, it's like a four-to-one ratio for women who reach 100 versus men who reach 100. They have a very active and outdoor life. But some people have wondered if geography helps. If you look at Sardinia, it's an island. If you look at Okinawa, it's also an island. So perhaps it's what's called a genetic incubator. We're going to talk about that a little later. There's also some mental factors with the Sardinians. They interviewed Giuseppe who's 85 years old. Hopefully he won't eat that in his hand because he's going to lose a little longevity from that, right? But the interviewer said, Giuseppe, you're 20 years older than the average retiree. Don't you ever feel tired and you want to stay home one day? He's like, I feel tired all the time. But if I stayed home all day, then I would be sick. That's kind of the opposite of what we think, right? But I can tell you that the majority of us in this world are not going to burn out. Most of us are going to rust out. So Giuseppe understands that. So he works a full day, even at 85 years of age. Sardinia also has some advantages in that their soil has 300% more antioxidants than the mainland Italian. So their grapes are like powerhouses of quercetin and resveratrol, which protect your heart. The other criticism, though, of Sardinia is that if you check their genetics, 80% of them are directly related to the original pioneers of that island. They also, like Okinawa, are losing their longevity edge because obesity now affects 10% of them. That doesn't seem like a high number to most people, seeing as the U.S. is like 36% obesity. And in fact, the majority of us in the United States are now overweight. Did you know that? It's unbelievable. But when you consider that Sardinia, uh, just a few decades ago, had nobody who was obese. Can you imagine that? 
Not one person. The other criticism is that Silanus, which is the blue zone of Sardinia, only has about 2,500 individuals. So from a scientific standpoint, when you don't have a lot of numbers, it decreases the power of your study, meaning the certainty that this is not due to chance. So that is a problem because if you don't have a lot of numbers, you can't make strong conclusions. However, here's the real practical question. What about me? I don't live in the country. I don't have my own garden. You know, my parents or grandparents or great-grandparents didn't live to 100. Do I even have a chance to live to 100? Well, actually, yes, because our last blue zone lives in quite possibly the worst air quality outside of China and Mexico City, smoggy Southern California. But they are a group of happy and healthy seniors well into their later years. One of their champions was Marge Jatan, and here she is, not in the country, but in the middle of the city, where she renewed her driver's license. They actually would not give her the 10-year renewal because she was 100. And they said, listen, why don't we just give you five years, Miss Jatan, and we'll see how that goes. She went through that five years, by the way, and she still was going strong. Interestingly enough, she was a nurse married to a physician. Her husband actually lived to 98, so he did pretty well, um, as well as his wife. This is a physician, uh, Dr. Frank Shearer, the oldest water skier on planet Earth at the time, 100 years old, barefoot water skiing even. How do you like that? How would you like to be able to keep water skiing into uh, your century mark? He's outlived the average physician by several decades. And of course, as you know, uh, of course, I'm talking about the Seventh-day Adventist as our last blue zone, which is kind of a unique blue zone because all the rest of them are geographic locations versus the Seventh-day Adventist church, which is a religion. Very different. I had the privilege of serving under Dr. Ellsworth Wareham, cardiothoracic surgeon, still doing open hearts at 91 years old? Would you allow a 91-year-old to do your open heart surgery? <laughs> I assure you that Dr. Wareham's hands were rock solid steady. And we all enjoyed operating with him because whenever there was a complication, he never got excited. He would just say, okay, uh, clamp that. Oh, suction over there. Oh, do that, you know. And he would never get excited or stressed or anything like that because he had been operating for longer than all of us had been alive. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I don't know if any of you know who Sanjay Gupta was, but he interviewed Dr. Wareham for CNN, and he was still mowing his own lawn, living independently, doing great. Uh, and he lived well over his hundreds. I believe he lived to 106, so he did quite well. Lydia Newton, at 112 at the time that this article was written, was among the 20 oldest people on planet Earth. And the author says something interesting. He's like, is it good genes? Is it divine intervention for their people? And he says, well, God may or may not have something to do with it, but their religion does. Seventh-day Adventists aren't a small group, uh, but as far as world religions, they are small. But scientifically, they have large numbers. The Seventh-day Adventist health study includes 50,000, 100,000 individuals at a shot. So the power is extremely good for those studies to say that these conclusions are not just random. In fact, uh, you guys have, I think, Michael Greger coming up, right, in a, in a, in a little bit. He's going to be coming and sharing with you guys. What's very interesting about Dr. Greger is he actually promotes the Seventh-day Adventist church. He's pointed out uh, several times that the Adventist church is the longest-lived blue zone on the face of the planet. But he's not an Adventist. Hmm, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So the Adventists are different than most blue zones. Uh, they're not isolated. They're not in the country, uh, at least not most of them. And they come from all races and not just one typical ethnic group, which is most of the blue zones. The common bond is their religion and lifestyle. So let's look at kind of the best of all the worlds. Generally, a plant-based diet. They don't smoke and generally don't drink. 
Uh, they're family oriented, and most of them have daily activity, or they should be getting daily physical activity. Here's another uh, secular article, How to Live Forever, from Newsweek. First one, you're female. Second one, you're Seventh-day Adventist. Very interesting, isn't it? I have to confess, this article did not have the giant red arrow that I had placed there for <laughs> Seventh-day Adventist. But, you know, I think it's interesting. They have other um, components of longevity. Flossing, how many of you knew about flossing for longevity? Actually lengthens your lifespan. Did you know about that? Anyone? Before this, maybe a couple of people. But I want to point out is a little apple at the bottom. Now remember, this is not a flow chart on mental abilities, okay? This is a flow chart on actually just living longer. If you started school later, you live longer. Isn't that interesting? Better late than early. Have you heard of that book, right? So that's the concept, is this little segment here says you actually live longer if you started formal education later. Now that kind of goes contrary to conventional wisdom, doesn't it? Yeah, get that kid playing an instrument at three years old, get him in school at four, right? Isn't that what they always say? But the conclusions now are that you should start later because that's not just better for your brain, but it's better for your existence. Where did we hear that before? Hmm, I wonder. U.S. News and World Reports, they published the 11 habits that will help you to live to 100. The first one, very simple. Those who retire, expire. So I'm very happy to see um, some of my mentors still going strong and not retiring. Fantastic. Uh, that's how you are going to keep living. Uh, I can tell you, not just keep your mind sharp, but keep your entire physical um, abilities intact. Uh, I want to share this from a personal standpoint. I work with a lot of sick individuals as a physician, and I work with a lot of elderly people. And one group of those seniors is very healthy. Another group of those seniors is very sick. One group of those people are my patients. The other group of those senior citizens are the volunteers pushing them around in the gurney. And of course, the volunteers are healthy, right? Even though they might be the same age, even though they might have all the same advantages or disadvantages. But that's ultimately what I would like to say is, even if you retire from your paying job, I know one of my mentors is, is here, Dr. Pondit. He may have done less clinical practice, but he's still doing his lecturing, right? He has not given up his ikigai, his purpose for living. And that is why he's continuing to go strong uh, in his ministry. Number two, flossing every day. Very interesting. You know, I want to share this from a Seventh-day Adventist standpoint. One person came up to me one time and they said, well, flossing's not in the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> they did. They said that. And I said, well, <laughs> do you remember what Jesus said to the disciples? I have yet many things to say unto you. Right? <laughs> And you cannot bear them yet. So that's the concept. But I want to just share this kind of remove from the um, sort of secular aspect and understand this concept of flossing. When we look at the health message, is it available to everyone? Yes. yes. Is it expensive? No. no. Is it hard to learn, like the basic concepts? No, no right? I mean, it's like eat right drink water, exercise, trust in God, don't worry, right? You know, stuff like that. It's pretty basic stuff, isn't it? And is it cross-cultural? Can it, can it transcend culture? Yes. Right? Yeah, you can make a healthy version of kimchi, right? Or a healthy version of every sort of dish, can't you? You can use lemon juice instead of vinegar, right? So anyway, the concept is there's principles in the health message. Because the health message is not getting an herb from a mountain in Tibet, right? That is not the health message. Although people are constantly looking in that, right? Oh, let me just get the right CBD oil or something like that, right? That's, that's always the way we're looking at the health message is we want the panacea, right? We want the one cure-all, fix-all. We're looking for that pot of manna, and we're going to find that pot of manna eventually, right? 
But that's not how the health message works, is it? It's something that displays the character of God, who God is. How we work physiologically reveals who God is because he designed us, right? A God that is no respecter of persons would make health accessible to the rich as well as the poor, would he not? He would make it accessible to the intelligent and to the simple. He would make it available to persons anywhere on the earth, would he not? If he was fair and loved his children equally, he would give them equal access. And it wouldn't be something highly complex. It wouldn't be something extremely burdensome, would it? So my argument for flossing is it is just that. Flossing fits perfectly into the health message because how long does it take you to learn to floss? Take the string, <laughs> right? I mean, that's pretty much it, isn't it? Scrape one side of the tooth, scrape the other side of the tooth. I mean, there's nuances, I'm sure, if you're any dental hygienist out here, maybe you can give me some additional pointers. But it's not rocket science to floss your teeth, is it? Is it expensive to floss your teeth? No, absolutely not. In fact, if you can't afford the floss, you can get some celery, right? Or, don't tell your wife this, you can grab your sock and then pull out a little string out of your sock. Just don't let her see that, though, right? But anyway, my point is it's simple, right? Everyone can do it, it's cheap, it's available, and you can learn it within like a few minutes, right? So I would say that flossing is perfect for the health message. It's a very simple way of maintaining your health. However, very powerful. When you talk to the principal investigator on the flossing studies, he believes that if he had more people enrolled, he would have shown that twice a day is even better than once a day. And you know, it's very interesting. I can prove to you how this works. Does anyone know how flossing helps your longevity? Anyone know how that works? Yeah, bacteria. I hear, I hear a few things. <clears throat> bacteria where? What's the issue with the bacteria? Okay. Oh, interesting. So... When you look at your gums and you haven't flossed for a while and then you floss, what happens? You bleed. That's because your gums were inflamed before you did that. And because they're inflamed, the bacteria in your mouth can make their way into your bloodstream, right? <clears throat> and, then, and then what happens is exactly what this sister said. You can get like inflammation throughout areas of your body, specifically your coronary arteries. And that's not where you want inflammation because it will lay plaque down and narrow them. So that's kind of the theory <clears throat> as to how flossing increases your lifespan. But you know, you don't even have to understand that. Just floss after you haven't flossed for a while and just smell what was in between your teeth. You will know that that was bad in there and you needed to get that badness out, okay? Because if you floss regularly, that's not the case, right? But if you let that food kind of sit there for a while, you don't want that stuff <clears throat> sitting around in your body and let alone in your circulation. Number three, how, how many people like to invest their money? Like to be, like have good investments? Yeah, the few people. How many people make 400% on their investments? Anyone? Talk to me later. I want to talk to you and learn. But exercise, as far as actual investment of time, is quite possibly the best investment you can make. When you look at what's called meta-analyses on exercise, that's where they take a lot of studies and they boil them down to one conclusion. Exercise of any kind that you do, right? If you do exercise, you'll live that time that you spent exercising over again and two or three times on top. So if you exercise an hour a day, you'll live that hour over again and two or three hours on top of that. Pretty good deal, huh? Yeah. yeah, pretty big bang for your buck. And some people will always say, well, what kind of exercise should I do? Or how much exercise should I do? Have you heard people say that? Here's what I'm going to tell you. The kind of exercise you should do is what you're going to keep doing. That's it. It's that simple. 
because, at least in this blue zone, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, only 10% of us are active every day. Only 10%. It's very, very bad. So anything you're going to do and maintain is what I'll recommend. And there's ways to add, you know, activity to your life. It's very simple. When you go to the store, don't drive around for five minutes finding that parking place like three feet closer to the entrance. Just park the car and then walk, right? Don't go over to the elevator, push the button to go down one floor. Come on. Just take the stairs, all right? That's okay. You can do that. So those are things that can kind of help you instead of getting the ride back, which was very nice. Everybody offered me a ride. I wanted to walk back, right, to where I was staying. Yes, it was dark. Yes, it was cold, but that's fine. I need that after talking all day anyway, right? When you look at the amount of exercise, what they've found is that individuals who are exercising a lot versus those who are sedentary have about 15% greater lifespans. What does that look like? Let's say the average lifespan is 80, right? What is 15% more? Yeah, that's 12 years. That's a lot, isn't it? And those studies looked at people who exercised roughly 600 minutes a week. That's a lot, isn't it? I mean, if you think about it, 600 minutes a week? That's crazy. That's like 10 hours a week, isn't it? If you did it five days a week, that would be two hours a day. Do you know anyone who works out two hours a day? And that's a lot. And the intensity was about five to seven mets. And what is that? Well, for most of us, it's like a small, like slow jog. So that's the concept is that they looked at people that were exercising that much, and the question is, well, what about more than that? They can't recruit enough people to create the studies. That's the problem, right? So the question is, how much exercise is most beneficial? Well, we know 600 minutes a week at about five to seven mets is definitely beneficial because less than that creates less benefit. But maybe the curve keeps going. Who knows? We do know that certain forms of intense exercise can actually be detrimental. They've looked at people doing marathons, and after the marathon, your immune system is extremely suppressed for a long time, like several days, even up to a week. So there are some forms of extreme exercise that can create problems uh, for your body. But definitely, how many people are running marathons in this room? Probably not that many. How many people online are running marathons? Probably not that many. So what I can say is most of us aren't getting enough exercise, and so we could definitely uh, get more. What's very interesting is when you look at actual benefits, like a lot of people are saying, okay, I understand cardio, I understand all that stuff, but I wanna build some muscle, I wanna get stronger, I wanna you know, do stuff like that. You know what's funny with the best exercises when you look at them? The best exercises are compound movements. And what does that mean? That means exercise where you're using a lot of different muscle groups. And what are those? They're all just work motions. Did you know that? Have you ever looked at someone who's a mason? They're strong. They're solid, right? Why? Because they do deadlifts all day long, right? I mean, that's what they're doing. Squats, deadlifts, pull-ups, bench, military, all of those motions where you're using lots of compound sort of movements, those are all very beneficial in muscle building and building strength. And of course, they happen to be work motions, right? They're all work motions. So we're actually designed for work when you think about it in terms of exercise. But there's very few studies that look at actual work. I mean, they kind of incorporate people who have active sort of work lifestyles, but not really specific. Number four, what's the most important meal of the day? Breakfast, Breakfast yes. But most of us miss that, right? Uh, the concept is, though, how many of you knew that eating fiber for breakfast was important? Eating a whole grain. Oh, wow, many of you. That's fantastic. How does that work? Well, when you eat a whole grain for breakfast, you control your blood sugar, not just for that meal, not just for that day, but you increase your longevity. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So try to get your oatmeal in the morning, or try to get your brown rice. If you like, are you a savory person? Anyone a savory person for breakfast? Oh, wow, that's great. Try to get your brown rice uh, for breakfast, 
or whole wheat toast or something like that. And number five, how many people get at least six hours of sleep every night? Not everybody, right? It's hard, isn't it? Some people will say, but I can't stay asleep. How many of you can say that? It's hard to stay asleep that long. You know what I'm going to tell you? It's okay to take a nap. I'm giving you permission right now. I'm giving you permission to take a nap. It's okay to take a nap. There's no problem with that. If you, let's say, sleep, you know, four or five hours at night, right? You can take a nap during the day. That's all right. That's no, that's no problem. And you can add up to at least over eight hours. Try to do that. Try to get that sleep in because you don't want to burn the candle on both ends. But the concept is, is it better to get your sleep at night? Of course it is, right? And the concept there is think about when you've had the best sleep of your life. What were you doing when you had a really good sleep? Yeah, you were outside, right? You were camping, right? You were on Yosemite trip or something like that. So you're outside, plenty of fresh air, and when you were on that camping trip, when did you go to sleep? Did you, like, stay up till 2 a.m.? <laughs> no, you probably didn't, right? You went to sleep early, didn't you? So you went to sleep early. It was outside. Was it generally colder than normal or warmer than normal? Colder than normal, right? Your body loves colder temperatures, but that warm little blanket, right? So you're breathing in colder air. You're breathing in fresh air, right? You're outside. You are getting to sleep earlier, right? I think those are pretty good ideas, right? So if you think about those concepts, when you sleep at night, Cover your vents, right? Open your window. Get uh, under that nice warm blanket. Or if you're married, cuddle up to your husband or wife, right? Stay warm. And you get plenty of fresh air. Go to sleep early, right? When do people go to bed before artificial lighting? Sure, unless you wanted to waste all your wood and waste all your oil, right? You went to bed early. And that's the concept. When we look at the actual hormone profiles when you go to bed, there's actually a spike of growth hormone that occurs at 10 p.m. And unless you are unconscious at that time, you're not going to get that spike. And that hormone is going to repair the damage during the day. It's going to maintain your lean mass, going to uh, help deal with the stressor sort of damage you had through the, through the day. So definitely take advantage of that phenomena. So if you go to sleep at, let's say, 9, would you be unconscious by 10 p.m.? Sure, probably. Hopefully you don't take an hour to go to bed. But I can definitely say from my standpoint, I have to use some little helps uh, because I'm constantly changing time zones. I used uh, some melatonin and valerian uh, last night, and I just was out. I think I slept like nine hours. It was fantastic. But... Try to get to sleep earlier. Take advantage of the hormonal benefit. Eating whole foods. I hope that's not you know, a news for people here. Uh, the more you mess around with foods, usually the worse you make it. And this is a concept. Whenever you go to the grocery store, when you walk into the store and you continue to walk straight, very soon, you will find yourself in the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> On either side will be crinkly wrappers waiting to entice you, right? Have you noticed that? <clears throat> if you walk straight forward, also when you check out, what's, what's nearby when you check out? Death, right? And disability on this side, right? <laughs> but here's what you do. If you walk into the store and then turn and go all the way to the end, to the outskirts of the store, where do you find yourself then? Produce. Produce, right? You find yourself in an actual good place, don't you? But it's hard to get to. Do you know why that is? When you look at the actual profit margin, where do they make the least amount of money off of you? Do you know? Where? Produce, that's right. That's the healthiest portion, but that's where they make the least money. Anyone know what product in the grocery store they make the most money off of you? 
soft drinks, that's right. Did you know that the soft drink in the can is cheaper than the can? Yes, isn't that crazy? Soda, on average, makes about a 1,000% profit. Not even drug dealers make a 1,000% profit. That's unbelievable, right? That's crazy. So keep that in mind, is that the more refined a food or the more changed or altered it is, generally, <clears throat> it's not as good for you. I want to share with you an interesting Scandinavian study. They looked at smokers, and if you smoke, what are you going to get? Lung cancer, right? Very simple. But they did an interesting twist on the control group and the experimental groups. They did three groups. The control group, all they did was smoke, right? Nothing else. And then they watched and saw how much lung cancer they developed. The second group, they smoked, but they ate high antioxidant foods, specifically A, C, E, and selenium. Where would you get lots of vitamin A from? Carrots, yes. Uh, like squash, orange, sort of yellow vegetables, but green leafy vegetables too. How about C? Citrus, right? Exactly. Oranges, lemons, strawberries, pineapples, and also green leafy vegetables. That's going to be the case for pretty much everything, right? How about vitamin E? Nuts, nuts and grains, seeds, right? Absolutely. How about selenium? Brazil nuts, sure, absolutely. I love that. I actually was in the Amazon doing some medical work, and they gave me this big brown sort of thing, and they took a machete and went, duh, 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 and they held it out to me, and I'm like, that is the whitest thing I've ever seen, and it was a Brazil nut. And I ate it, and I said, I can feel the selenium flowing through my veins. <laughs> I'm like, wow, I want to go back to Brazil now. And they gave me, have you heard of acai? Or acai, am I pronouncing it wrong? Have you had that fresh? Oh, that's no joke. I was like, can I get some more of that? They're like, well, we need to, we are out of it, or something like that. I like drank a whole glass of it. It was fantastic. So these people ate foods that were high in those antioxidants. And then the last group, they ate the same amount of antioxidants that the other group got, but in the form of pills, in the form of supplements. So the control group, they got lung cancer. No surprise, right? The group that ate the high antioxidant foods, as well as smoking, do you think they got less cancer, the same cancer, or more cancer than the control group? Yeah, less. How about the antioxidant pill group? More. Yes, they got more cancer. They actually had to stop the study and say, please stop smoking, everybody. You who are taking these pills, don't take them, and everybody eat oranges and green vegetables and grains and Brazil nuts. That's what they had to say. Because from an ethical standpoint, if you have a difference in morbidity or mortality, you have to unblind the study, and you have to reveal it to your subjects because that's not cool to let people die, right? So that's the concept. Eat whole foods. Number seven, I need a volunteer. Who would like to volunteer? I won't do anything embarrassing to you. Don't worry, it's fine. Anyone volunteer? Come on forward. Sister Joyce, right? All right. I'm going to give you my remote, OK? And I'd like for you to look, face the audience and hold the remote at arm's length. Like this? Yeah. Is that heavy? No. No? She says it's not heavy. But actually, it can be. Thank you. It just depends on how long you hold on to it for. You thought about that? You may have something very light. It may not bother you very much right now. But if you continue to hold on to it, did you know eventually my deltoid will fail and my trapezius will start to help it? My scalenes will start to help it. Then eventually when those fail, my back will actually become scoliotic to help. My hips will shift to maintain holding on to this. And that's what many of us are doing. We may not have a heavy burden, but we're not letting it go. It's killing us. It's not always what you're eating, but it's what's eating you. And that's very true in the scientific literature. When you look at type A personalities, there are two components of the type A personality that kills them. Anyone know what that is? Like, you know the type A person. They're very organized. They're on time. They're very ambitious, right? Leader type. 
What kills them, though? Co-worker. Not stress. Yes, it's how they interact with a coworker in which way. There are two things that kill you in type A. Number one is hostility. Right? It's one thing for you to be on time, but what happens when the other person is late? <sighs> right? The other thing is intolerance. It's one thing for you to be opinionated, but what if somebody disagrees with you? <sighs> right? Let's make sure he's not on the board next time, right? And that's, what we, that's what we do as human beings. It's sad. We are hostile and intolerant. And I'm telling you that when you're angry with somebody, even if you lose your temper for a second, did you know that if you lose your temper and recover in one second, for the next three or four hours, your risk of fatal heart attack goes up three to 400%. Bitterness and anger is the poison that you drink, thinking it will kill someone else. But it won't. But it will kill you. And that is proven scientifically. Number eight, I have to make a confession. The article, U.S. News and World Report, they initially said, live like a Seventh-day Adventist. But I'm just going to invite the whole world to become a Seventh-day Adventist. That's all right, you know? If each one of us just brought one person into the church a year, did you know that within seven years the entire world would be Seventh-day Adventist? Isn't that amazing? Can the work be finished? Yes, of course it can be finished. And is one person a year a lot to ask? I don't think it's a lot to ask, right? But it's amazing. If that happened with every one of us, it would be phenomenal. The work would be done. So average North American, 79 years. Average North American, 7th-day Adventist, 89 years. 10 years longer? That's phenomenal. But then there's individuals like... Uh, Miss Reichard's uh, mom, right? She's well over 100 and still going strong. Then there's Adolph Grams, right? I remember he was actually my dean at one point. And I'll never forget something he said. He, he, he actually gave me the opportunity. I was um, <clears throat> needing to work my way through school, which you actually could uh, at one point. But now you have to like sell drugs to work your way through school. It's very difficult, right? You, can, you, can your students still work their way through school here? Is it hard? It's becoming harder, I'm sure. But the concept is, is that they were short student workers. They were short manpower one summer. So they offered the students to double whatever they earned during the summer. If you worked at least 12 weeks, they would double what you earned at the end. So, of course, you don't say that to someone like me. Like, I'm Chinese. You know, I'm going to work that. You know what I mean? So I, I got a job in hydro and massage in the morning. And then I got a job in the clinic in the afternoon. And then for every meal, I got a job for New Start. So I was the host serving at New Start. So my day began at 5 a.m. and ended at like 5.30. So I worked 12 and a half hours because even during my meals, I was still on the clock because I was serving for the guests and whatever. And then on Sundays, I split wood. And they're like, well, we're not going to pay you to split wood because we have a wood splitter. And I said, yes, but the wood splitter requires two guys to do it. So if I can split at least half as fast as a splitter, would you pay me? They said, yes, we will. And so I learned to do that. So basically, I worked about 60, 65 hours a week all summer long. And then they had to double it. <laughs> and then they had to do time and a half for everything 40 to 60 hours. Anything over 60 was double time. That's the law. Did you know that? So even though I was making a minimum wage, I think I ended up with like 10000 something at the end. It was fantastic. And I was able to pay. And then they canceled that program the next year. And they never did it again. <laughs> probably because of me. I don't know if you remember that, Pastor Krams, but you probably don't. But Mr. Sample came up to me one time during supper. He says, do you know you're making more than me right now? <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's the concept. Um, is that uh, <laughs> when, you, when you're willing right, to you know, focus on something, uh, you can be very busy. But of course, the problem with that is um, I was very tired and I wanted to go to sleep early. And where this comes in with Adolph Grams is that they had worship in the summer very late. And I said, listen, I want to go to sleep because I got to be up at like 3 or 4 in the morning if I want to have my devotions. And he says, Tim, we're going to give you permission to do that. So they gave me permission to miss the later worship so that I could have my devotions in the morning. Because he always told me, Tim, before you talk to man, talk to God. Amen. 
Before you read man's words, read God's words. I've never forgotten that from your father. Tell him thank you. Give him a big hug from me, right? All right. Number nine, <clears throat> have you ever noticed that the people who have a routine tend to live a lot longer? They tend to be a lot more relaxed instead of like constantly chaos? That's very important. If you get up, go to sleep, exercise, eat at the same time every day, your body will love you for it. Have you ever noticed that you're at work and you know, noon comes around, you're supposed to take your lunch break, but then you keep working, you're really, really hungry, but then you stop being hungry? Have you ever noticed that your body kind of changes, kind of shuts off? That's because you're not following the program. So be a creature of habit, your body will love it. Number 10, how many people have a sister? Raise your hand. How many people are really close to their sister? Raise your hand. You will live longer, did you know that? Now, why that study didn't work out with brothers, I'm not really sure. Maybe sisters are better listeners. Maybe women are more empathetic. I'm not really sure. But the data showed that if you were close to your sister, you had a lower lifetime incidence of depression and you lived longer. How many people have ever cared for an elderly individual in their home? Anyone? Like a parent or uncle or grandparent or whatever. What's very interesting is this was the Journal of Human Evolution that looked at this. This was the Berlin Aging Study. And they found that if you had an elderly relative in your home and you were not the primary caregiver, that that person who lived there lived longer and everyone in the household lived longer. Incredible. And the conclusion they made on that study is they say this was a way of protecting and prolonging the genome, of course, right? It's all about evolution. But the funny thing was, is they found that even non-relative caregivers got the benefit of being in that household. And they said, we don't know how to explain that, but I do, right? You're supposed to take care of the old people around you, right? It's that simple. So if you do that, not only will they live longer, but you will live longer as a result, as long as you're not the primary caregiver. So share the load, right? Don't try to do it on your own. I see these individuals, they're giving 24-7 care to their elderly relative with no break and with no relievers. Definitely don't do that. That is not going to work, just FYI. Number 11 was the longest prospective study they've ever done in the history of mankind. They looked at children and they tried to isolate what personality trait predicted longevity. So what ended up happening was conscientiousness came to the top. And what is really conscientiousness? Well, it means you say what you mean and you mean what you say. You follow through, right? You don't try to cut corners. It's almost moral in a sense, if you think about it. Conscientiousness. Some people will say, well, they were conscientiousness to keep their doctor's appointment. I don't give myself that much credit. Some people will actually say, what about positive thinking? Have you ever heard about just being optimistic, like seeing the glass half full rather than half empty? Well, here's the problem with that. Oh, look at that. I've got this little mole on my hand. Uh, it's fine, right? No melanoma, right? Actually, it's not melanoma, but I'm just using that as an example, right? I fell on my bike and I got like a piece of gravel in my hand, and it's just, it's just hyperpigmented after that. It's never grown. But the concept is, do you need to get stuff checked out? Sure you do. Sure you do, absolutely. So conscientiousness. All right, let's take a look at our video. Because what do these three things have in common? You don't have to believe me. You can hear uh, David McLean, who is the photographer of the Blue Zones explain what he saw as he traveled from country to country. There's no sound in the beginning. Don't worry, it's working all right. Don't blast everybody away. So he's going to look at Okinawa, Sardinia, and Loma Linda. And this is kind of what he saw. And just to give full disclosure, David McLean is not a member of any of these blue zones. He has no conflict of interest. 
He has no stock in Loma Linda or anything like that that I'm aware of. He was just the guy um, commissioned to take all the pictures. And this is kind of basically his take on it and what he learned, which I think is significant because coming from outside the Blue Zones, I think he gives a different perspective than those of us who are a member. My name is David McLean, and I traveled to three different cultures of longevity, which are Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, and Loma Linda, California. So we went and spent time in each of these places and tried to learn about their cultures of longevity and exactly what it is they're doing to live vital and healthy lives well into their hundreds. The first longevity hotspot we traveled to was Sardinia, Italy. So in this region, men are living as long as women, which is just an incredible phenomenon. Science isn't exactly quite sure why, but one of the theories is that it's because the women wear the pants and that men have less stress as a result. But also the Sardinians have a fanatical zeal for the family. And we dropped by one four generations of one family and every weekend they shared this giant meal. And this social component of longevity is incredibly important. And at the time I remember thinking, this is what being alive and having a family is all about. But the cultures of longevity in Sardinia are rapidly disappearing, and the root of them are a move away from traditional natural food in conjunction with a sedentary lifestyle. We spent time with a woman who was almost 100 and her great-granddaughter, and later that day we saw that same great-granddaughter eating potato chips, and we wondered, will she live as long as her great-grandmother? The answer is no. <laughs> Okinawa is an archipelago in the far south of Japan and home to the longest lived people on earth. And we met numerous people who were into their hundreds, who were leading active and very healthy lifestyles. You know, the 90 year olds were biking and fishing eight miles offshore with these old diving techniques on the reef. And we met an amazing woman who was over a hundred. Her name was Kamada, and she had been in a moi. Uh, the rough translation is that it's a group of friends who go through life together and help each other. And the energy and vitality that they would get from that, I believe, factored into the longevity equation as well. And the Okinawans have this wonderful word. It's called ikigai, and it translates roughly into the reason for which you wake up in the morning. And all of these centenarians had ikigai, and I don't think it's an accident that that's part of the reason that they're living so long. So one of the cornerstones of Okinawan longevity is caloric restriction. Yet, interestingly, they're eating a lot of food. The trick is, is that the food that they're eating is all low in caloric density. And that food included these beautiful miso soups that were filled with carrots, seaweed, onions, and potatoes. And like the Sardinians, the Okinawans grew most of the food themselves in their gardens. And they would go to the store for very little. But Okinawa is losing its longevity edge. Okinawa has the highest rate of obesity in all of Japan. And it was quite shocking and somewhat disturbing to see this culture of longevity disappearing right before our eyes. Listen to this. By far the most surprising fact that I took away from this story is that Seventh-day Adventists outlive their American counterparts by about 10 years. What are they doing? Quite simply, the Seventh-day Adventists, who largely populate Loma Linda, California, have a religion that reinforces positive, healthy behaviors. For example, if you're a devout Seventh-day Adventist, you I are a vegetarian, non-smoker, non-drinker, <laughs> who takes a Sabbath every Saturday, where for one whole day, you have to just unplug... So we met many incredible people there. Uh, the most incredible by far was a woman named Marge Jatan, who had just turned 100 and renewed her driver's license. So we went for a cruise. But before we did that, we had to go through a morning routine where she lifts weights and rides a stationary bike. And interestingly, the Seventh-day Adventists are the only culture of longevity that we visited who are not losing their longevity edge. And I photographed a baptism at this church. And I remember thinking, wow, this is the perfect example of how this religion is still growing and carrying forward. I think in America, we tend to marginalize old people, kind of 
put them away in retirement homes. But these amazing people in three different cultures represent the potential to see your great-grandchildren grow up, a potential to be healthy and happy well into your older years. And that, to me, was the biggest thing I walked away with from this assignment was that, wow, you know, I now have this sense of responsibility and control based on choices that I make. I'd read that genetics only account for about 30% of how long you live. So, you know, the majority of how long you live is up to your lifestyle. It's up to you. All right. So we'll go back to our presentation. And here's the question. What's the secret? That's what people ask me at this point. Just give me the secret to live longer. I don't want to hear about all that stuff. Just give me the secret. It's got to be diet, right? Everyone always says that. You know, I think it's funny. As Seventh-day Adventists, which most of us, I believe, are here in this audience, we feel like nine out of ten illnesses have their origin in non-veganism. But that's not true. Nine out of ten illnesses have their origin where? In the mind, right? And what's very interesting is the reason why this is not the panacea is because the number one blue zone. Anyone know what the number one blue zone is? Out of the five. Seventh-day Adventists. You know what the number two blue zone is? The meat-eating Seventh-day Adventists. Nobody tells you that, right? But that's the thing, is even the latest Adventist health study, did you know the pescatarians defeated the vegans for the first time? They lived longer. Now, they theorize because, oh, it's because the pescatarians ate less dairy than the vegetarians and this, and that moved them ahead, or there's less omega-3s, and they do all this theorizing, right? But ultimately, I'm going to tell you, full disclosure, we have the lowest level of commitment to our own health message than the history of our church right now, as far as the Adventist Health Study. And if you, I'm talking about North America. If you go outside North America, if you're vegan, you're like a kook. You know what I mean? You're like extreme, you're like reform Adventist or shepherd's rod or something, like immediately labeled, right? You're immediately labeled as some weirdo, right? So the concept of it being dietary would be okay if it wasn't for the fact that there are people who are vegan. Did you know that? Hindus, Brahmins, they're vegan. Do you know that? Buddhists, did you know their priests are all vegan? They could look at the longevity edge, but it's not there for them. Right? There are whole cultures that are plant-based. Did you know that? Where's the data? It's not there. Right? So it's not all about diet. What about exercise? Well, as I mentioned to you, the top blue zone, the Seventh-day Adventists, 10% of us are active every day? Yikes. Yeah, it's even worse. <laughs> that's what Mrs. Emerson is saying. So that's the concept. If it was all about exercise, right? Anyone remember Jim Fix, like way back when? Jim Fix? He was all about exercise, and then suddenly everybody was like, okay, maybe it's not about exercise because what happened? He died, died, right? He dropped dead, and he was active, right? He was running marathons, and they found that he was riddled with plaque, right? He had an MI. So it's not just exercise. Well, what about genetics? Could it be just genetics? Well, here's the concept. When you look at the United States, African Americans traditionally have a higher risk of diabetes, hypertension. But did you know that when they join the Seventh-day Adventist Church, those risk factors go down? Interesting, isn't it? She's living testimony right here. She, Joyce, Sister Joyce raising her hand. That's me. So fantastic. So how is it that you can gain the benefit of the blue zone without being genetically related? Right? So it's not just genetics. What about optimism? We talked about that. You have to actually have some realism. You can say everything is going great when it's not really going great. Don't ignore the elephant in the room, so to speak, right? The big issue. Well, what about faith? Have you thought about that? A lot of people will say for Adventists, well, you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't use caffeine. Well, first of all, we do use caffeine now, unfortunately. 
I think it's about 20% now or more uh, are using caffeine. And, and some of us even drink, actually, when you look at the actual Adventist health study. But did you know there's another religion that doesn't smoke or drink or use caffeine? The Mormons, right? And they do live longer, but they are not on CNN, Anderson Cooper, Oprah Winfrey, National Geographic, because the data is not that strong, right? If you want to look at it, Bigelow is their principal investigator out of UCLA, and he looks at the Mormon sort of advantage. But what's interesting is they do some things that maybe we would do well uh, to think about. You know, our prophet talks about short fasting. They actually fast once a month. Did you know that? That's kind of a precept of their sort of religion. And we've been told, you know, especially brain workers, we should do a fruit fast for a weekend, right? So faith, yes, but which faith? Right? That's, that's really the question. And is faith in and of itself beneficial to you? It is, but not significantly. Like if you're committed to re your religion of any sort of faith, you get about two years. But I don't want two years. I want like 50 years or more, right? That's the concept. And here's what I want to share with you. The Adventist Health Study is not run by Adventists. The NIH funds it millions of dollars a year. They're not believers, they're atheists. These guys, Gregor, Clapper, Barnard, Campbell, all these people, they're not Adventists, just so you know, right? They're Jewish or atheist or New Agers. If you've seen Barnard's wife, she's like left field, right? She's definitely New Age. Look at her cookbook, how it all began, right? So that's the concept. How is it that these individuals are not even part of the blue zone that they are studying, right? Here's the concept. When you look at the difference between populations, you have to look at the difference. You have to look at the things that are different. Vegetarianism, veganism, that's shared by other people. You have to look at the differences. But here's the issue. If we really believe that it's here, right, and not just here, why aren't we looking at those concepts? But I'm going to tell you right now, the NIH is never going to create an Adventist study that says, how strongly do you believe in the sanctuary? How strongly do you believe that God will not burn you forever in hell? How strongly do you believe in the state of the dead? They're never going to do that. You know why? You don't look at data until you're ready to deal with the results. And what they want, quite frankly, is they want the 10 extra years without God. That's why they're never going to look at those parameters. They never will. And so they'll continue doing the Adventist health study till Jesus comes back. And they'll say, oh, do you have forced air heating in your house? They'll look at all these things trying to find that magic bullet without God. But here's the thing. Do some of the blue zones get an advantage without God? Yes. And that shows you who God is. God is merciful and gracious to those who follow his precepts, even if they don't believe in him. Right? Do the Sardinians get an advantage? Sure they do. Do the Okinawans get an advantage? Sure they do. They all get an advantage. Nicoya gets an advantage. Ikaria gets an advantage. If you follow the principles, you will get an advantage. Are the lifestyle guests all Seventh-day Adventists that come? Do they get better? Sure they do, right? And that's the concept. When you look at false religions, the way it works is if you do this and you please that deity, then you get back the benefit, right? That's how false religions work. See, if the false religions were actually what ran the world, that little puffer fish would have surrounded Israel with the structure, wouldn't it? But no, the puffer fish only makes it in Okinawa. I mean, uh, in Japan, right? The most atheistic nation. Because God is good to those who need him most, right? That's the opposite of false religions. When you understand that concept, you begin to see who God is through the blue zones. Number one, God is not a respecter of persons. If you follow the precepts, he's going to bless you. Whether or not you know it's him, 
whether or not you believe it's him. Can you imagine if I walked past a patient's room? Have you ever done this? Anyone ever been a patient and like been in trouble and say, hey, help, help you, right? A doctor such and such. Well, that's not my patient, right? You don't do that, right? You say, hey, room three, who's got room three? They're in trouble or whatever. Or you come in and try to help them. People call out to God all the time. They may not call him the right name, but do you think he helps them? Yes, of course he helps them. Of course he does. So from the blue zones, we learn that God is not a respecter of persons. He will bless and benefit those who walk in his ways, whether or not they believe in him. But here is the real kicker. If you don't believe at all, okay, You don't believe in what I shared Friday, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon. You say, I'm going to throw it all away, right? Here is the appeal. Just get the 10 extra years. Why not? Why wouldn't you? If you don't believe, right, this life is all you got. Does that make sense? You die and you're fertilizer. That's the concept. So why wouldn't you take the 10 extra years? Why wouldn't you take that as a benefit? That's the concept. Is even if you don't believe at all, just go for it. You know, the concept of God giving grace to those who don't believe in him is one thing we learn. But I believe the most important thing we learn from the Blue Zones is the following. If you don't believe in God... You don't read the Bible, right? You're not religious or you're not part of any Christian religion, right? And you're only looking to say, how do I live? What path do I follow? What do you have? What do you have to guide you? All you have is what group of people is living the longest and the best quality of life. You realize that's all you have? Why does God create the blue zones? Because he has to leave the light on for those who don't know about him. He has to show them the way. Why does he still bless the Adventist church, though we're the most rebellious of our history? It's because he has to show the light for those who don't know. The reason why I believe the Adventists still maintain that 10 years is because God must show the way home for those who do not know him. But he would rather it not be 10 years. He'd rather it be 50 years, right? Here's the concept. He wants us to prosper in how many things? All things and be in health just as our soul prospers. God's not just interested in heaven. He's interested in now too. He wants you to have that benefit because it's not vain to be worried about the gray hairs. It's not vain to say, what about those wrinkles? It's not vain to realize we're not as tall as we should have been. That's not vanity. God put eternity in your hearts, but we're seeking for it in the wrong way, right? The way we get back to eternal life is through him, not just eating the right things and doing the right things, right? You'll get the 10 extra years, or even you get 20 extra years, you still die the second death, right? I mean, that doesn't help you. But here's my appeal to us as Adventists. When you look at Daniel and his three friends, he was a captive, right, in the court of Babylon. There were gathered representatives from how many lands? All lands. Men of the? Highest talent, men most richly endowed with natural gifts and possessed of the broadest culture that the world can bestow. Yet among them all, the Hebrew youth were what? Without a peer. What does it mean to be without a peer? There's no equal. There's no one even in your dimension, right? But the thing is, when she says they were without a peer, she doesn't first say, oh, they were spiritual. Do you realize that? The first thing she mentions after that is in what? Physical strength and beauty in mental vigor and literary attainment. They stood what? Unrivaled. The erect form, the firm elastic step, the fair countenance, the undimmed senses, the untainted breath. 
I can tell you, I have people like when I'm talking at the door, sometimes I'm like, okay, I need a little bit bigger bubble, uh, brother, or, or something like that. The untainted breath all were so many certificates of good habits, insignia of the nobility with which nature honors those who are obedient to her laws. Do you realize what this is saying? Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in Babylon as captives, they were showing the way home. They were showing the Babylonians how to get back to Eden through their lives. And that's the thing, is you can be a beacon to show the way home to others. God doesn't want you to just live 10 more years. He wants you to be like this. Do you realize that? They're like, wow, there's nobody else like you. You're the most amazing lawyer I've ever seen. You're like, I, I wish I had 10 workers like you, right? They looked at them and they thought, wow, there's no one like you. But is that the way we are as Adventists? Yeah, we get the 10 years. But like I said, when you look at Deuteronomy and read what God wants for his people, he says, you're going to be so amazing that people will come to you and say, who is this God? And these laws and this wisdom that you have. Do you know why that would happen? In a group, a cohort of millions of people, how many sick people were among them? How many diabetics? How many vascular disease? How many cancer cases? It says not one feeble among them. Do you realize that? If we had a disease incidence and prevalence of zero, do you think that would get the world's attention? Yes, it would. You would be the wonder of the world. You would be the head and not the tail. So my appeal to you as a Seventh-day Adventist, if you are a Seventh-day Adventist, will you show the way home in your life? Because they won't believe anything else, right? They'll just look at your life and they'll say, wow, I don't have any friend like you. I don't have any friend that's as honest, has integrity, who's as strong, who's, girlfriend, what program are you doing, right? That's how they're going to be drawn to us, is the health message, right? And also the way we treat them. So that's my appeal. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist, my appeal is let's be like this. Not just so we can be, oh, wow, we're so strong and we're this, whatever, right? But to show the way home for those who don't believe, that's all they've got. Let's show that they can have life, but they can have even more. How many of you can think of one area in your life that you could probably improve as far as the health message? You know what it is, and I would like to appeal to you. If you would like to say, God, give me grace to improve in this area, not just for myself, but so that I can be a light on the way home for those who don't know the way. If that's your decision, please stand with me as we pray. Loving Father in heaven, you have placed eternity in our hearts, a desire to live not just longer but forever. The reason why the gray hairs and the wrinkles bother us is because they weren't part of your plan. Your plan was for us to live forever. And to live forever young. To live in the light of day when night would never come. This world was not your plan. Disease was not your plan. Aging and death was not your plan. But Father, how can we show the world? How can we show them the way? They don't know you, Lord. They don't read your word. We may be the only Jesus that any of them ever know. Lord, help us by our lives to live in such a way to show them the true path home, to show them that this is the way to life and to life more abundant. Lord, thank you so much that despite our rebellion, you have kept us as the number one blue zone, as that light home for the world who only believes in science, who only believes in secularism. They look and they see that there is a people who lives longer and stronger. May they have a desire 
to learn more, Lord. May they have a desire to come. Maybe they come just for the 10 years, Lord, but may they stay and find life eternal. Lord, you've seen those of us who are standing, and we ask that you would use us as beacons to light the path to come home. Not just for 10 years, Lord, but for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.